In 2015, Bernie Sanders began dismantling the U.S. taboo against socialism by presenting it to his millions of supporters as a viable alternative to capitalism. By 2019, lots of U.S. Americans were feeling the burn as roughly 40% of them openly identified as socialist. But Bernie Sanders, apart from modest praise on particular issues, overwhelmingly rejected socialism as it existed in the USSR, China, or Korea. So given that socialism is such a broad tradition with many strands of thought that often conflict with one another, what is it that unifies socialists under the banner of socialism as a whole? In the broadest sense of the term, we could say that socialism is a political movement pushing towards a more egalitarian future society based on principles of freedom and justice. Almost all streams of socialist thought argue that such a perfectly egalitarian condition can only be achieved when we have a classless, stateless, moneyless society, and where the means of production are held in common and controlled by the workers. But the problem with these definitions is how vague they are and how they don't really capture the actuality of socialism in politics today. The discourse of a classless, stateless, moneyless society is almost entirely absent from the vocabulary of socialism in the 21st century. So to pin down a conception of socialism and see how it operates, we have to understand its historical development in relation to its opposite, liberalism. Liberalism is an Enlightenment philosophy that emerges during the transitionary period from feudalism and the divine right of kings to capitalism and republican forms of government. This transition period sought to challenge the authority of the church and monarchy by affirming the capacities and rights of individuals. In 1689 England, John Locke argued that the church and state should be separated and that they should be constrained from infringing upon the inalienable, God-given rights of individuals, life, liberty, and property. Locke's treatise, which was presented as a negation of the divine right of kings, is one of the earliest foundational texts of liberalism. But when his philosophy, with its particular emphasis on private property, was applied to economics, a new form of social inequality emerged, not between the state and its subjects, but between those who owned property and those who did not. When this reality began unfolding, critics started referring to liberalism as individualism, and socialism started to form as its opposite. In 1789, the French Revolution erupted under the banner Liberty, Equality, Fraternity. Leaders of the French Revolution were largely inspired by Jean-Jacques Rousseau and strongly believed in the principles of liberalism but argued that they had been applied incorrectly or incompletely in England. The French sought to maintain individual liberty from the state, but also believed that liberalism needed to make stronger considerations for the collective, what Rousseau called the general will, or what the revolutionaries called fraternity. The revolution gave rise to a whole branch of criticisms of liberalism, as well as a wide range of radical ideas for a future society. These thinkers, which became known as utopian socialists, became the first to explicitly set out the values and principles of a just future society. Henri de Saint-Simon, writing at the dawn of the 19th century, was perhaps the earliest socialist thinker to conceptualize social inequality in terms of a comprehensive totality. Saint-Simon was a committed advocate of the poor and worst off, which was influenced by his Christian background that emphasized that the poor were also fellow brothers in Christ. Charles Fourier maintained that private competitive production was inefficient and unnecessarily wasteful and argued for a cooperative model of production where labor was divided, rotated, and incentivized in a manner that encouraged voluntary participation and prevented worker burnout. Fourier advanced the causes of the poor, children, and was an early champion of defending homosexuality as a personal choice. He is also credited for establishing the term feminism. Gracious Babeuf was a French revolutionary who was widely seen as the first communist. Decades before Karl Marx, Babeuf argued for the destruction of the class system through the abolition of private property. Pierre-Joseph Proudhon would later clarify and crystallize this sentiment and ultimately declare that property is theft. 
Robert Owen is an early example of utopian socialism making its way to England. But Owen is exceptional for attempting to implement his ideas on a consciously organized commune. He saw that humans were a product of their environment and therefore believed that a properly shaped environment would cultivate socialist dispositions through habit. He was a strong advocate of worker rights, childhood education, and collectivism. These thinkers, among many others, presented political ideas that were progressive and inspiring. But the problem was that they remained lofty ideals that were disconnected from prevailing circumstances. Robert Owen's communes, for example, only lasted two years because they were founded on the assumption that communes could be built in isolation from the larger society. In general, utopian socialism failed to adequately answer the question of how to materially transform society to go from A to B to C all the way to Z. It wasn't enough to introduce progressive or utopian ideas, social and material relations needed to change as well. This was Karl Marx's criticism towards utopian socialists in the mid-19th century. He argued that while utopians did in fact have progressive ideas, they remained lofty and fragmented. Not only did the utopians all have radically different diagnoses of social problems, but their solutions did not directly emerge from a scientific understanding of prevailing conditions. Marx's notion of scientific socialism overturned not only utopian socialism, but the entire doctrine of political economy as well. He argued that an objective conception of reality can only be achieved if the scientific method is applied to a study of history and society. Only once we have thoroughly understood how social and material processes develop historically can we take hold of them and guide them towards an achievable form of socialism based on the abolition of private property, communism. Marx was not the first to place the abolition of private property at the center of socialist aims, but he was the first to give private property an objective class character that was rooted in a scientific analysis of the capitalist mode of production. Marx showed that private ownership of the means of production was the basis of class inequality and that achieving a more egalitarian society was therefore rooted in abolishing private property. He argued that communism would be a system of social production, where goods are produced by each according to their ability and distributed to each according to their needs. Marx believed that the crisis of capitalism would produce a socialist revolution in the near future, just as the crisis of feudalism had produced a capitalist revolution in the past. He further believed that this revolution would begin in Europe, where capitalism, and therefore the contradictions of capitalism, were most developed. Europe did indeed come close to socialist revolution in Marx's lifetime, particularly in the case of the Paris Commune. But the first self-described socialist revolution to successfully overthrow the dictatorship of capital and introduce a worker state was not in the capitalist countries of Europe, but in Russia in 1917 when the Bolshevik Revolution gave rise to the United Soviet Socialist Republics. The Russian Revolution presented a model of successful socialist revolution that had never before been achieved and went on to inspire many revolutionary socialist movements across the colonial world. These socialist experiments had terrible crises as well as great success. Russia and China both experienced devastating famines under socialism, but socialism also put an end to the history of famine reoccurring in these countries approximately every 10 years. In the first 60 years of socialist revolution in both Russia and China, life expectancy doubled, homelessness was virtually eliminated, child mortality dramatically dropped, and the entire population became literate and educated. These colossal accomplishments were achieved in the USSR and China faster than any capitalist society at any point in history. However, socialists in developed Western nations did not always agree with the authoritarian tactics of Eastern communism, and the repressive tendencies of Stalin's USSR only affirmed their skepticism. State bureaucracy, secret police, labor camps, and shortages were taken as evidence of a digression from socialism, not an advancement towards it. Western socialists began to see the merits of markets, while Western capitalists began to see the merits in social provisions and welfare programs, giving rise to so-called mixed economies. 
Out of these new circumstances emerged democratic socialism, an evolutionary socialist movement that sought to inch towards socialist society, not through sudden revolution, but through incremental and decentralized reform. The founder of this approach, Edward Bernstein, not only criticized the USSR for its anti-democratic tendencies, but also its naivete in believing that the state could plan the future operations of an apparatus as complex as the totality of society. Other than a minority of anarchists and communists, socialists in the Western world generally subscribe most closely to Bernstein's definition of socialism. Democratic socialism was born out of a hope that introducing decentralized democratic participation would allow the working class to incrementally shape capitalist society in its collective interests. This hope was tied to its critique of the USSR, which argued that centralized authority and power were hindering worker democracy in Russia. Democratic socialism saw a great deal of success in the Western world between 1950 to 1980, where economic and political freedom was extended to the working class. During this time, it could have easily appeared that democratic socialism was guiding capitalism towards dramatic social change for the better. But despite this temporary success, the rapid establishment of neoliberal hegemony in the 1980s reversed many of the previous gains made by democratic socialism. Debates within the socialist camp are varied. Revolution versus reform, centralized versus decentralized power, transforming the base or transforming the superstructure, socialism from below or above, etc. But despite these various political differences, the common aim of achieving a free, equal, and just future remains the central feature of the global socialist struggle. This video was made possible by the generous support of the patrons of this channel. If you would like to join them, you can do so at patreon.com slash redpenyoutube.